Good evening. Uh, it's great to see everybody here. Hi, I'm Jeffrey Cohen, the Executive Director of Jewish Imagine. We could not be more pleased to bring Alex Hirsch out to New York for this presentation. I'm sure um, a lot of you watched the debate last night and probably no matter where you fall on the political spectrum, you probably felt like you needed a shower afterwards. <laughs> but tonight you're going to feel completely different. You're going to be inspired. You're going to be motivated. If you're not already vegan, you will be inspired to go vegan. And if you already are, you'll be inspired to ramp up your activism. So, um, yeah, I've had the benefit of being a two of Alex's past presentations of this nature, and you're really in for an unforgettable experience. Now, for the moment we've been waiting for, Alex Urshan. <laughs> just, just to put Alex in perspective for um, the few of you who don't know who he is, when Veg News Magazine did their Mount Rushmore of legendary American vegan leaders earlier this year. Alex was on there, and in my book, he should have been the only person on Mount Rushmore. Um, Alex, um, you're actually, I don't need to give a long intro because his presentation tonight is largely gonna be about his personal story. So that saves me um, a lot of work. But one of the many ways that Alex has helped Jewish Mesh, by the way. But Alex, just so you know, um, was had a, uh, emerged from the Holocaust, got a PhD in chemistry at Iowa State, and had a successful, relatively lucrative career going as a wastewater consultant. And he gave all that up to create the first organization in American history devoted to farm animal advocacy. It's amazing. This was in the late, it was exactly 40 years ago because they're about to celebrate their 40th anniversary here in New York on October 15th. 40 years ago, the ASPCA, the Humane Society, was doing nothing but kiss about farm animals. Alex was a true visionary. He created an organization called the Farm Animal Reform Movement, which 40 years later is stronger than ever. It's now called the Farm Animal Rights Movement. And not only is Alex's organization doing great work, he and the organization convene the annual Animal Rights Conference, where all the other organizations come to share ideas and best practices. So we're really talking about, um, I shudder to think where the vegan movement in America would be today without Alex Urshia. Now, I know Rosh Hashanah is coming up, Mishnah Tova, by the way, but I wanna invoke something from Passover here. You know during the Seder, we either say or sing, Dayenu, enough. Well, that's kind of how I feel about Alex, because Alex, all he's done for farm, he was 80 years old at the time, did not need to come onto our board. But just lending his name to our board would have been amazing, Dayenu. <laughs> but no, he actually gave us tremendous advice and was actively involved in every board decision, Dayenu. See where I'm going with this? <laughs> he um, helped us network with other supporters. He um, uh, has also been my personal mentor in about 95% of what I know about vegan advocacy, I learned from Alex Urshia. So we are very grateful for him because I can say with uh, complete confidence and honesty that Jewish Veg is um, really exciting growth in the last three or four years would not be possible without the leadership advice and help of Alex Urshia. So I'm really thrilled to present him now to you for a presentation you're gonna remember for many years to come. My friend, Alex Urshia. too kind. Uh, well, folks, uh, I need your vote. How many people here are in favor of my losing my coat? <laughs> Thank you. Well, 
thank you very much, Jeffrey and Jewish Bench. And thank you all for coming. You could have stayed home tonight to watch Dancing with the Stars or The Voice or the umpteen post-mortem on yesterday's uh, presidential debate. But instead, you chose to be here, and I'm honored by your presence. Thank you. In the past 70 years, I have thought long and hard about my Holocaust experience and what it could teach us. You may not agree with my conclusions, but I hope that you will find them stimulating. Uh, my dad was a chemist at the University of Warsaw. He was researching heavy water, which is a critical coolant in uh, nuclear reactors. This was uh, 1938, mind you. Uh, he received a US visa to work on the Manhattan Project uh, but he insisted on a visa for me and my mom as well, and that, of course, never came before the war. Uh, my mom uh, was a mathematician. At the, uh, she used her good looks and her cunning to keep my dad and myself alive through most of the war. And. Uh, I wasn't always old. <laughs> In fact, uh, I was five years old on September 1st, 1939, when the Nazi armies invaded Poland and set up martial law. Uh, six months later, uh, we and 450,000 other Jews throughout Warsaw and the surrounding areas uh, were ordered to move into the Jewish section of Warsaw under penalty of death. In fact, all the decrees were under penalty of death. Uh, most had to move in with strangers. <clears throat> we were fortunate in that my grandparents had a nice apartment in the Jewish section, so we were able to move in with them. Eventually, we noticed certain streets being blocked to traffic and sections of walls going up here and there. And on November 16, 1940, those sections were joined and tapped with barbs of, uh, with strands of barbed wire, and the Warsaw Ghetto was formed. Uh, 450,000 of us were cramped into an area of barely five square kilometers. Uh, that works out to about 10 times the population of most downtown areas. <clears throat> uh, crowding and food shortages became unbearable. Typhus became epidemic, with victims lining the streets. During the first year, an estimated 80 to 100,000 died of starvation and disease. We did our best to cope with these hardships. Illegal workshops were created to manufacture clothing and other goods that were traded, uh, smuggled outside the ghetto by children and then traded for food and brought back into the ghetto. Uh, there were even health clinics, public soup kitchens, libraries, musical performances, an orphanage, and a rudimentary school system. A Jewish council collaborating with Nazi authorities maintain a semblance of order uh, with police, firefighters, and medical responders. In the middle of 1942, the Nazis began what they called Operation Reinhardt, 
named after Reinhard Heydrich. Some of you may have seen the movie about his attempted assassination in Czechoslovakia. Operation Reinhardt, which today we know as the final solution. Uh, between July and September, they dragged several hundred thousand Jews from their homes to the death camps of Treblinka and Auschwitz. The key element of the operation was thorough deception to prevent a mass revolt. We were told that we were being resettled in the East, away from hunger and disease. We were told to label our suitcases carefully with our name and address in case we got separated in transit. The Treblinka gas chamber was even decorated with the Star of David to suggest a synagogue. And the inside was disguised as a shower compound. It is estimated that nearly a million Jews were gassed, exterminated in Treblinka and many more in Auschwitz. They left behind only piles of shoes, glasses, hair, and charred bones. Silent memorials to thousands of sentient living beings who were no more. On April 19, 1943, several thousand Nazi troops backed by tanks and returned to wipe out the remaining 50 or so thousand residents of the Warsaw Ghetto. They were met with vigorous resistance that lasted for weeks. The date of April 19th is now observed throughout the world as uh, Yom HaShoah, or Holocaust Day, except it's usually observed on the 27th day of Nisan on the Jewish calendar. On May 16th of 43, after leveling every building and massacring the survivors, Nazi General Jürgen Strop telegraphed to Hitler that the Warsaw Ghetto was no more. Today, a monument to the uprising bears lone witness. I am alive today because my grandparents had two blessings. They had a substantial collection of jewelry and they had a living maid, a Russian living maid named Yuliana. <clears throat> Yuliana had been with them for many, many years. Uh, they were the only family she ever knew. She spoke with them only in Russian and she became part of our family. When we moved in with my grandparents, we became part of that family as well. When the ghetto was formed, just like all Jews had to move into the ghetto under penalty of death, all Gentiles had to move out of the ghetto under penalty of death. Uh, but Yuliana refused to move because we were the only family she ever had. Some years earlier, Yuliana had joined the Society of White Russians in Warsaw in order to maintain her contacts with the Russian language and literature and culture. White Russians were the folks who were fighting the Red Brigades in the Revolution of 1916-17, whatever that was. 
And uh, of course, uh, when the Bolsheviks won over, they had to leave the country, and they settled, many of them settled in Poland. And the Nazis were cultivating them because they were in the process of con conquering Russia, or so they thought. This was before Stalingrad. And they thought that once they conquered Russia, that uh, the white Russians would become their puppets and uh, run the country for them. <clears throat> so basically, Yuliana went to her white Russian society and she said if she couldn't stay with us, she would jump into the river and drown. And she actually meant it. So they gave her two permits. They gave her a permit to live in the ghetto, and more importantly, a permit to go in and out and to bring food. Uh, this was a huge blessing for us because it enabled us to collect clothing and other valuables from friends and neighbors. Uh, Yuliana would then wrap these things around her body or hide them in various ways, take them outside, trade them for food, and then bring the food back, and then we would distribute the food to the people who gave us the clothing and valuables. <coughs> Now, during one of the mass roundups in the fall of 1942, the Operation Reinhardt, uh, one of those roundups snagged Juliana. And uh, even with her, all her white Russian permits, she was barely able to extricate herself. My grandmother, who ran the family, uh, decided that things were getting too dangerous and that Juliana had to leave. Of course, it was a big tragedy. There was a lot of crying. And, and finally, Juliana agreed, but only on one condition, <clears throat> and that is that she could. on the condition that she could take me with her as her son, so that I would live. <clears throat> she did this knowing full well that harboring a Jew was an instant death sentence. <clears throat> My grandparents gave Juliana three batches of jewelry. The first was for the German guards, so they wouldn't ask too many questions at the gate about Juliana's new son. The second was for the Polish hooligans who were hanging outside the ghetto gate, extorting money from escaping Jews. And the third was to allow Juliana to start a new life outside the ghetto. Uh, my dad had a sister who was a well-known dramatic actress in Poland. She had taken on a gentle, uh, sorry, gentile, gentile stage name, and she married her Christian director, so she passed for gentile, and she never went into the ghetto. So Juliana brought me to my aunt's apartment. And we never saw her again. Eventually, my mom and dad were able to join me. And uh, my aunt's partner was active in the Polish underground. And uh, they were able to get us false identification papers and a place to stay. And this was the beginning of a two and a half year ordeal from uh, uh, roughly mid 43 to early, well, to mid 45, roughly two and a half years of life in hiding. It was a life of constant alerts to any suspicious sounds, 
statements or glances, and occasional close calls. My dad lived separately from us, so that uh, if one of us got caught, he wouldn't implicate the other under a different name. I was only eight at that point, but I was trained to report any unusual statements or events to my mom immediately, so she could react. Shortly after we settled in our new apartment, I was playing with the other kids, and I overheard the two mothers talking, and one said to the other, who's this new kid? And the other said, oh, he belongs to these people who moved into second floor back apartment. And the first one said, oh, you mean where they took those Jews out? And uh, yeah, these are probably Jews too. And uh, I was taught not to run, to walk away slowly. And of course, I immediately went to my mom and reported this. Uh, in Warsaw, you couldn't just move, because if you, you had to register your residence. So if you moved, you would leave a trace, and they would know where you moved. And so as moving would immediately set off alarms, and it would be make it easy to find us. So my mom left some things in the apartment and she told the superintendent that I wasn't feeling well and that she was taking me to the countryside to get some fresh air. So we did, we moved in with a farm family near Warsaw. Of course we never went back there. Uh, but there was a question of money. Uh, we didn't have any income. <clears throat> so my mother remembered what we did in the ghetto. <coughs> and she would take the train to Warsaw and buy used clothes at the street markets. And then she would wash them and mend them and walk from village to village with a backpack <coughs> and sell these clothes to the local villagers. It got to the point where she would actually take orders, you know, sizes, colors, that sort of thing. She became a constant supplier for the surrounding villages. And she, my mother was very gregarious, very friendly, and she made friends easily. So one of the villages, she, <coughs> oh, and the other thing that, uh, that was kind of interesting is uh, the farm where we were living was run by a woman who had three sons, and she sent two of the sons to Warsaw to get, get their own jobs, and one of the sons was helping her run the farm. And because my mother kept taking the train to Warsaw, like every couple of days, she would bring food from the farm to the sons in the city. So she got to know the sons. So anyway, as she was walking through one of the villagers, one of her friends said, you know, funny thing, you'll have a great laugh. But you know this guy who owns the clothing store here, he never really liked you very much because you're underselling him. And he thinks that you may be Jewish. Yeah, my mother thought that was really funny. I mean, her being Jewish, I mean, how ridiculous can you get? So she had, they had a good laugh and she walked slowly out of sight. Uh, she dropped her backpack, and she broke into a run. <clears throat> it took her about an hour to get back. <clears throat> Got back to the farmhouse around midnight, she told the woman, <clears throat> I need to get to the train immediately. <clears throat> the woman didn't buy a pat an eyelash, woke up her son, said, take these people to the train station. Son objected, and, but she was running the farm, and, and we were out to the train and back to Warsaw. Uh, fast forwarding a few years after the war, when my mother came back, <clears throat> she found the sons, and through the sons, she found the mother. <clears throat> A 
And she asked her, you know, I came to you in the middle of the night and asked you to take me to the train station and you just didn't ask any questions. What's, what's going on? And the woman <laughs> said, ah, I know you were Jewish all along. I don't care about these things. And by the way, the Gestapo came about an hour after you left. Uh, just to give you a few highlights of the two and a half years. Eventually, we were all separated. And I'm going the wrong way. Yeah, eventually we were all separated by the Warsaw Uprising in August of 1944. My mother was deported as a Gentile to a labor camp in Germany. Uh, after we were liberated in 45, she came back, found me in an orphanage. We spent five years in an Italian refugee camp. I emigrated to the United States, and uh, she spent uh, her remaining years in Israel. Uh, uh, yes, I do plan to write a book. <laughs> Once my life was no longer in danger, survivor's guilt set in. Questions I kept asking, why was I spared when so many good people were not? And how can I repay the debt for my own survival? So naturally, I became involved with several movements for social justice, religious freedom, uh, civil rights, humanism. But none of those seem to hold the answer. In 1972, I moved to Washington to work for an environmental consulting firm specializing in hazardous waste management. I was assigned to do a wastewater inventory of a Midwest slaughterhouse. As I was walking around making notes, in the waste storage areas, I suddenly came across piles of hoops and hearts and skulls and discarded bodies, all bearing silent testimony to the living sentient beings who were no more. I recalled in horror, as most of you would, memories of the death camp piles came running through my mind. I dismissed it as mere coincidence. I kept repeating to myself, they're only animals, but it didn't work. I just could not get those images out of my mind. As I grew more familiar with factory farming and slaughter operations, I noted with horror the striking similarities between what the Nazis did to my family and to my people and what we do to animals that we raise for food. The branding or tattooing of serial numbers to identify the victims. The use of cattle cars to transport victims to their deaths. The crowded housing of victims in wood crates. The arbitrary designation of who lives and who dies. The Christian lives, the Jew dies, 
the dog lives, the pig dies, the constant vilification and abuse of the victims to make the killing more acceptable. And of course, the deception about the horrors behind the death camp or the slaughterhouse walls. My head was reeling. If killing animals was indeed morally equivalent to killing people, how does my enlightened society sanction this? The very society that liberated me from the Nazi nightmare. Am I going crazy? And then I saw a quote by 1973 Nobel laureate Isaac Pasheve Singer, and it suddenly all made perfect and horrifying sense. He wrote, to the animals, all people are Nazis. And to the animals, life is an eternal Treblinka. This is when I finally realized that there was a valid reason for my surviving the Holocaust and a valid way to repay my debt for surviving. This is when I resolved to spend the rest of my life fighting all forms of oppression, and specifically to start with our oppression of animals raised for food. Well-meaning people have challenged my decision. Why work for animals, they counter, when so many human problems remain unresolved? When nearly 900 million people on our planet go hungry, 22,000 children die every day. When 37 million people suffer from HIV AIDS. When 300,000 Syrian men, women, and children have been massacred and millions more displaced by their own government. And closer to home and today's headlines. When more than 20 of our veterans commit suicide each day and unarmed black men are routinely shot and killed by police. Why animals, indeed? Well, for starters, because they have feelings, personalities, and interests, just as we do. Uh, this is Lola. Lola was only an animal, an adorable Yorkie, but you couldn't convince my daughter, who assured me that Lola was the only grandchild that I would ever have. <laughs> Lola had obvious feelings of joy, affection, and sadness. She was able to relate to my daughter in ways that I could only hope for. When Lola got sick, my daughter went into debt, spending thousands of dollars on veterinary care. When Lola died, my daughter grieved for weeks and never really forgot. Undoubtedly, many of you in this audience have had a similar experience. The refrain their only animals didn't work for my daughter, didn't work for you, just as it didn't work for me after my slaughterhouse experience. Why animals? Because they are the most oppressed, sentient living beings on earth. Each year, billions of animals are confined, caged, beaten, raped, deprived, shot, poisoned, and killed in our nation's farms, slaughterhouses, laboratories, and open spaces. And each year, our society subsidizes these atrocities with its purchasing power. Why animals? 
Because oppressing animals is the gateway drug to oppressing of others. Permission to oppress first rears its ugly head in a child's mind when he is told that the family dog on the couch is to be loved and cherished, but the pig on his plate is to be tortured, killed, dismembered, and consumed as food. Why animals? Because all forms of oppression are inexorably linked. That goes for Jews, Armenians, Tutsis, Bosnians, people of color, gays, and yes, the animals. And they are linked not by the identity or the relative moral value of the victims, no. They are linked by our willingness to oppress others, which makes it all possible. The animal holocaust analogy has nothing to do with comparing Jews and pigs, nothing to do with comparing Hutus and Tutsis. It has everything to do with the tragic, pervasive commonality of the oppressive mindset. Why animals? Because I can. I have the amazing power just me, to spare 100 terrestrial and aquatic sentient living beings just by choosing a diet that happens to be also healthy for me and for the planet. And each time I get 10 other people to follow suit, I multiply my power tenfold. I don't have the power to save the hungry, the ill, and the shooting victims. Why animals? Because the most fitting way to honor the memory of my family and my people who perished in the Holocaust is to show that their sacrifice has not been in vain. That it has taught us a lesson And uh, the lesson that it has taught me is that we're all capable of oppression. Millions of otherwise upstanding Germans, Poles, and others knew about the death camps in their midst, but pretended not to notice. Just as we pretend not to notice the factory farms, the slaughterhouses, and the laboratories in our own neighborhoods. As Nobel laureate Elie Wiesel pointed out, silence favors the oppressor, never the victim. For me, the most compelling lesson, this is the most, to me, the most compelling lesson of the Holocaust, is that the silence of ordinary people in the face of oppression or their willingness to subsidize oppression of other sentient living beings at the supermarket checkout counter. That, to me, is the lesson. This is why. This is why animals. My friends, ultimately, the struggle for animal rights is not about them. It's about us. It's about, it's about our own willingness to defend the most defenseless, the most oppressed, the most vulnerable beings on earth. Theologians have long debated whether there is life after death. When it comes to our oppression of animals, I wonder whether there is life before death. 
Through the years, we have developed ingenious, dispassionate, cruel ways to oppress animals, all designed to feed our own greed and gratification. Animals raised for food stand out because they account for 98% of the total and because their abuse is so evil. Pigs are born from sows who spend their entire lives in tiny metal crates that prevent them from turning around. Their babies are torn from them shortly after birth and slaughtered at six months of age. Those who still consume eggs should know that half of all the chicks hatched, the males, are ground up while fully conscious or simply dumped to suffocate slowly in large plastic garbage bags. In a grisly sort of way, they are the lucky ones because they die more quickly. The females are cramped five to seven birds into small wire cages stacked on top of one another. They are packed so tightly that they cannot extend their wings or move about. When their egg production declines, the birds are hung by the legs and slaughtered while still conscious. Dairy cows are raised in large mechanized dairies with no access to the outdoors. They are artificially inseminated and kept pregnant to ensure a constant supply of milk. Their babies are torn from them at birth and chained in small wood crates so that humans can drink their milk. The cows search and bellow for their babies for days. But it's not just about them. Meat and dairy products are laden with saturated fats, cholesterol, hormones, pathogens, antibiotics, and excess protein. They lack complex carbohydrates and fiber, as well as many essential vitamins and minerals. Consumption of animal products has been linked conclusively with increased risk of obesity, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and several types of cancer. Conversely, fruits, Vegetables, whole grains, and legumes supply all essential nutrients, protein, carbohydrates, fiber, antioxidants, and a variety of beneficial phytonutrients, which reduce the risk of heart and other chronic diseases. Plant-based foods contain little saturated fat, no cholesterol, no drugs. Animal agriculture is more devastating to our natural environment than all other human activities combined. Animals raised for food in the U.S. produce 150 times the amount of waste that people do. The waste is stored in huge open cesspools uh, which overflow into our waterways when it rains. And that destroys fish, aquatic life, and of course destroys uh, the, uh, the you know, recreational ability of the waterways. <clears throat> According to a 2006 report by the United Nations, animal agriculture generates 18% of man-made greenhouse gases, more than transport. Subsequent studies place that figure at closer to 50%. Animal agriculture turns lush forests into barren deserts. The process begins with clear-cutting of forests to create pastures for cattle, 
As pastures become overgrazed, they are plowed under and turned into animal feed croplands. Rains wash the nutrients from the land into nearby streams, again, killing aquatic life and the soil's productivity. But there's more. For those of you who trust the Bible, there's Genesis 1.29. Those of you with an affinity for Israel may be pleased that in terms of dietary choices, <clears throat> Israel is indeed a light unto the nations with the highest percentage of vegans in the world. Indeed, my friends, we have a choice every time we shout for food. We literally make a choice to subsidize life or death. We can choose healthy, life-affirming foods, or we can choose animal products with their deadly impacts on animals, on our health, and on the health of our planet. Those of you who wonder about protein, plants offer a huge selection of protein sources. Those of you who crave the texture and taste of animal products can choose from a rich variety of plant-based meat, cheese, ice cream, and yogurt in your neighborhood supermarket. And Israelis have even more choices. <laughs> Deuteronomy is asking us to make a choice between life and death. I have said before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. My own life's journey has led me to choose life. Please join me. question is, is this reform an effective way to um, address this whole issue, or um, is it just a tokenism that makes people feel a little better and they're not going to do anything more? Um, how effective is reform um, as a hakshara, a, a, a training ground for going much further? As a, as a first step. So what I'm asking is, is abolition, uh, advocacy of abolition the way to go, or is reform a step in the right direction? So I, I want you to know this question was not planted. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, one of the things we do is, Jeffrey may have mentioned this, we do an annual conference for the entire animal rights movement. And uh, this is uh, one of our fondest subjects for debate has been for the last 20 years. <clears throat> My own personal view is that reform is not the way to go. That uh, it's, uh, <clears throat> that, uh, uh, what, that, uh, well, uh, just to make it very quick, uh, 
depending on which poll you're listening to, roughly 90% of people uh, oppose the abuse of animals for food, and 98% continue eating them. So obviously, if people think that animals are treated less cruelly, uh, then they win. I mean, the, not the, the, the consumers who want to continue eating them win. The industry that's continuing the abuse wins, and the animals lose. But the people who do support reform, and the, the Humane League, which is one of the sponsors here, supports reform. They, they're engaged in a very successful uh, <coughs> cage-free campaign in Massachusetts right now. They claim that theirs is the way to abolition, eventual abolition, uh, and that remains to be seen. I, if you ask me that question 40 years from now, I'll be better equipped to answer. <laughs> yes. uh, so I'm interested in the question of the uh, Okay, I will speak loudly. So it's very tricky making comparisons between the lives of humans and the lives of animals. Nevertheless, people want to say that the life of an animal in a factory farm is analogous in some respects to the life that people led, say, in ghettos or in concentration camps. I wonder, a lot of people think that animals in factory farms would have been better off never having been born in the first place. This is a, I don't know the answer to this question. This is a genuine invitation for you to, to tell me what you think. If your life had ended, as so many people's lives did, in the ghetto, would it have been a life that you would live again? Or is it a life that is close to the lives that a lot of animals experience in factory farms, of being lives that if we cared about these individuals, we would never lead them to experience in the first place? I'm not sure I'm getting it. <laughs> Here's the short version of the question. Okay. If you were told that you were going to have a child, and the child would just live the life that you had up until you left the ghetto, and that was it, would you choose to have that child? Oh, no. Okay, that's all I want. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, but uh, you raise an interesting point. Okay, so. Because people will sometimes ask, well, why didn't you just revolt? You know, why didn't you just just die in, you know, in a, in a massive revolt? And, uh, and that is because it, surviving the ghetto wasn't just keep from getting shot. It was also, you, you also had to have a will to survive. You had to find some way to say, to, to keep you going. And the way you kept going is one day at a time. You kind of kept re repeating to yourself like a mantra, you know, tomorrow will be better, tomorrow will be better. But if we knew that, there would be no better. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I had a similar experience, but a little bit later and in Hungary, where I also was born in the ghetto, and only my mother and I survived. And just totally by, quote, accident, that I saw somebody walking on the street, and she was wearing a t-shirt that said, the, um, what happens to the veal, the, the baby veal in crates? And she had something on the front of the shirt, and the story continued on the back of the shirt. And I walked behind her, and I started to talk to her, a complete stranger. And she said, I'm going to a PETA meeting. I said, what is PETA? What does that mean? She said, I'll take you there. And that's how I got into animal rights. This goes back to 1985. And I'm a second generation Holocaust survivor. It's a little bit later than you. But it has impacted my life. And what I learned about animals and animal suffering is so much in my mind of what I learned about my mother's life. I cannot separate the two. It's been in my writing, in my thoughts, in my dreams, always together the same. And I feel that what Simon Wiesenthal, the famous Nazi hunter, had said, 
uh, when they asked him, you, you remain alive and all your family is gone and when you die and the six million ask you, well, what did you do with your life? You were alive. You, had, you were allowed to live. And he said, I never forgot you. Because he was the one to dedicate his life to finding the Nazis. And I want to say that to the animals, when I'm gone, that I never forgot you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Susan. Yeah. Uh, can you speak loud or would you like a mic? Yeah. Um, so many of us who are interested in this intersection of spirituality and religion, whether that be um, the Abrahamic religions or any type of religion, um, and animal rights and environmental studies have always thought about this concept of dominion, and there have been books written about it, and um, I think that all of us kind of have different answers to what people ask as well, what about dominion of humans over animals, doesn't that mean that we can use them however we want? How do you personally answer that question, and do your experiences in your life and what you've been through, has that shaped your answer for that question as well? Yeah, uh, well, for me it's easy because I'm not a member of any traditional religions. <laughs> I'm not encumbered by the concept of dominion, but uh, uh, how my views have been shaped, yeah, that's what I talked about, uh, you know, I, I came to realize that, you know, the, the, the Nazis didn't have a trademark on oppression, you know, that this is something that all of us are capable of, and some of us are practicing it today, maybe not directly, but we're paying for it. So I'm an animal rights activist because of You better use a mic sure. because you, you're not very loud. Sure. <laughs> so uh, I'm an animal rights activist because of my you know, Holocaust education that I got when I was very little, part of my Jewish upbringing. And you know, that's the whole inspiration for my entire life at this point. Uh, but and, and I'm still told all the time when I, that I really shouldn't mention it by people in my family that this is the sort of motivation for me because it's so emotionally charged and offensive to a lot of people. And it's probably the hardest single thing in my advocacy is that I can't even talk about the thing that motivates me to be who I am. And so I just wanted to get any advice from you about how people who are motivated by this, or how we can talk about this in a way that is effective and uh, satisfy that drive. So you're raising some interesting points. The, the answer, the short answer to your question is you can't. Uh, you know, I, I have this special privilege, unfortunately, uh, that allows me to do that. And even with all the explanation that I go through that I'm not comparing the victims, that's still, it's still a sensitive, tricky subject. Uh, so, yeah, uh, but uh, yeah, this isn't really part of tonight's program, but uh, let me just reflect on what you asked, because <clears throat> we're kind of getting a little, you know, it's an interesting subject, but uh, I find that there is there is a culture of victimhood. Uh, I remember, <clears throat> I mentioned that my mother moved to Israel after the war and I came to the United States and I went to visit her, of course. And I complained to her about the, uh, the Israeli treatment of the Palestinians. And uh, her response was, well, you know, we can do this to them because of what the Nazis did to us. And I said, well, you got it backwards. <laughs> it's because of what the Nazis did to us that we should be more sensitive to victimizing other people. And uh, I find that uh, her, uh, she changed her views before she died. Uh, just, but uh, I find that it's not an uncommon view. And uh, I call this the, uh, the 
how does the, the culture or the tradition of victimhood, and the, there is a certain comfort in being a victim, in reveling in your victimhood. I find that very distracting. Uh, because it basically says that you don't need to do anything to make yourself a better person because you've already been designated by your oppressor. So you're, you're done. You might as well just fire. And uh, I really, you know, I, this was not part of tonight's program, but you, you stimulated this, and it, I feel very strongly about that. Ah. I can speak without. Yeah. Well, first of all, I wanted to thank you so much for coming here this evening. It's so brave of you to talk about these experiences. Um, and what I find fascinating, I've known other Holocaust survivors, is that instead of getting bitter and, and giving up on life, uh, it just fascinates me that how they cope emotionally, and not just cope, but you're just incredible that you turn something that is so heinous into such a life-saving endeavor. And what you said about the animals is so true. They're the most oppressed of any of the sentient beings. And why not the animals? Because we're all connected. And the way we treat the animals does reflect us as a society, as a culture. And it just makes so much sense for anyone, even if you're not vegan, to hear your words. It just resonates so strongly. And I just want to thank you so much for this. It, it's always exciting to hear you speak, Alex. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, that was Laurie Jordan, and she reminded me that uh, that we first met in 1984 at the Democratic National Convention in New York. <laughs> we, were, we were trying to get the delegates to give some thought to animal rights in the writing the platform for the Democratic Party. It didn't work, but we had a good time, right? <laughs> Yeah. Hi, good evening. I'm oh here. my gosh, you don't need a mic. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for having me. I'm the CCO, Chief Compassion Officer of Jewish Initiative for Animals, a new project that we work with Jewish Veg on. And I, I want to ask about the For the Animals uh, part of, uh, of, of, of the mission and something that clearly is is very important to you. I definitely became vegan as, as a result of being uh, for the environment, uh, and then only later learned about the animals, and eventually was like, yeah, I lost 20 pounds. That was great, like bonus <laughs> health. Um, and, but I find the animal part is the hard, the environment's the easiest one to like convince people on, because most modern people like science. Um, but the animals <laughs> one, is people don't want to hear it, and they're they're just too upset, and they're uh, they kind of have empathy fatigue from all the other things you mentioned earlier, all the things in the world we could have empathy for. And I'm actually really interested in the role that our movement can have, whether it's spiritual or religious, or just you know getting in people's kishkas and being like, it's okay to feel things, it's okay to have compassion for these animals, and how do we have that use the animals themselves more as a doorway to recruiting people to eating fewer animals. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. So this is uh, interesting because it, uh, well, first of all, just to let me answer your point in two ways. A direct answer is that uh, the argument uh, needs to be tailored to the audience. So we work primarily with the, the 14 to 24 age group. And so we do the animals because that seems to be the part that impresses that age group the most. Obviously, if we're talking to older folks like me, we might tout the health aspects. Uh, environment doesn't seem to be terribly effective as a tool for uh, vegan advocacy. And I have my theory about that, which I will lay on you. Yeah. <clears throat> so, I think advocacy is inversely, the success of advocacy is inversely proportional to the amount, I'm a scientist, <laughs> to the amount of effort that the person has to go through to abide by the advocacy. <laughs> That's probably a more elegant way of saying that. But, 
So we sometimes compare ourselves to the struggle for women's rights, for gay rights, for children's rights. And, uh, and that's comforting, and we should. I'm not, but uh, when you're advocating for gay rights, I mean, if you, if you came to somebody and said, be for gay rights, you say, OK, what do I have to do? Well, nothing. You know, just, uh, just don't abuse the next person when he's gay. You know? <laughs> oh, yeah, I can do that. But, you know, you ask them to change their lifestyle three times a day, now you're asking. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting. We have a lot of work ahead of us. Yeah. So my family um, tells me a lot that, um, in, I guess to try and get me to eat meat again, that you know the way that animals are raised for kosher meat is more humane than other types of meat. Yeah, I know. Um, I don't know enough about it, so I'm wondering if you have any insight on what I should tell people who try and use that logic on me. That's an easy one. <laughs> It's not. <laughs> yeah, it, it just isn't. You know, the kosher slaughter involves conscious animals. And uh, for whatever benefit it is to be unconscious when you're killed, uh, you know, there's certainly no improvement. I mean, the intention was good. And uh, Jeffrey can probably address this better than I can. He's a walking encyclopedia on Jewish traditions. The, the, the concept was good at the time, but. Not today. So Jeffrey says that we're running out of time. Yes? One more question. One more. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I was at Farm Sanctuary for the hoedown, and someone asked this question, and I'm curious on how you feel about it. Um, no one in my family is vegan. None of my friends are vegan at all. I'm making vegan friends. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, recently, I didn't have any vegan friends. And it's becoming more and more difficult for me to you know, share a meal with people that are eating meat. And I know that there's online, as you can take the pledge to not sit at a table when meat is being eaten. And um, Jean Bauer answered this question, and I'm just curious about how you deal with that and how you feel about that issue. Thank you. Uh, about eating with others who eat meat, yeah. Lauren Gazzola? Lauren made a whole speech at our conference a couple of years ago about that. <clears throat> I really what I'm asking is yeah. which way do you think you can make more, have more of an impact? Oh, well, you have, oh, no, you, you, you have more of an impact by being there, by bearing witness, you know, the old Mahatma Gandhi thing, uh, be the, be the, what, the, the, the change that you want to make, yeah, just by being there, you don't have to preach, just the fact that you are doing something different, you say, oh, what, you know, they'll ask questions, and gives you a chance, you know, this way, you're not, being obnoxious, you're not being imposing your views, you're just answering the question. Yeah, but uh, can you deal with it? Well, some of us can, some can't. Uh, I, I don't have any words of wisdom on it. <laughs> just, yeah, but I think you can do the animals more good by participating and, uh, and just being gentle but helpful to your friends who are really eating with you. Yeah. Okay, four quick things first. One more round of applause for us. Thank you. Yeah. This week is a quite a few other things. First of all, if you like the hors d'oeuvres, you'll love the dessert. So please stick around for a short dessert reception and another chance to talk it up. Number three, um, please leave your name tag on the registration table on your way out the door tonight. We'll reuse them, not the paper part on the inside, but uh, the plastic part. So why don't you come back? 
Uh, we, we do want you to come back and we'll have your name dead waiting for you. And number four, um, you heard Alex just say, we are engaged in very tough work. Behavioral change, that's exactly what this Fed Starter Guide is designed to help people with. So please, um, any, you can see Evan or I, we have our square reader, you have the envelopes, uh, please consider that we really appreciate it. Thanks again, we'll see you at the dessert reception.